You're in the wrong one. Oh, see, we're down to two. That's okay. We'll get you here. All right, we're just going to get started with you guys then. Inspection? You want to? Okay, good. Are you in the right one? Okay, that's okay. Cool. So I'm going to ask you guys a question as we, we get into this a little bit. Um, are you doing inspection yourself? Are other people in your company being fed data by you? Is that where, where you're basically at? Yeah. So it, for me, it's learning what's available such that I can maybe find a good time. Okay. If I wanted to get better at knowing what it's what Yeah, I'm and doing. totally informative, yeah. Um, how about yourself? Um, we just got a 3D um, photo inspection device. Okay. Yeah, and it's for visual inspection, so it's a scanner type, not a touch type. Right. Okay, interesting. Very cool. Cool. Well, we'll uh, you know we'll see where this takes us. So um, my name's Darren, and I've been here for a while. Let me make sure my slides are actually going to transition for me. There we go. So I'm in my 21st year with SolidWorks, and when we started, we only had 3,000 users, and we were really just a cute CAD product at the time. Um, obviously, we've grown from being just the CAD product to actually encompassing pretty much every area of a company in our, in our tools. And we're trying to feed everybody you know, with that data and, and collaborate and overlap as much as possible. So that's where one of this, this tool comes in. Now, in my you know, work day, I use the software a little bit. I'm usually supporting customers and doing things based on what you do. When I'm outside the job, I'm doing more of my own stuff. So, you know, this is a treehouse that I built and I happen to use weldments in SOLIDWORKS to do this. And if you weren't aware of that, it's just frame members, stick figures. Uh, it's the matter of having the right profiles there. You get wood instead of steel stru structures. Uh, same bill of materials, same type of cut list. And I use the software a lot just to make sure that either my ideas are sound, things are going to fit, um, you know, show other people what's in my head, like my wife. And in a lot of cases, it just leads to a, a good product because if you plan your product properly, you just execute the plan. You don't have to think about it. And I have a 3D printer at home, which these days, um, these are some of the parts that I have, and I'm gonna show you some inspection, um, or some model-based definition on this part later. The inspection's a little different. Uh, but I built a part here that actually adapted a rod that I had had to a drill, 90-degree um, drill turn, so I could drill a screw in from four feet away on top of that tree house. So different things that I'll do. Now my latest one was cannibalizing this uh, trolling motor and basically designing up a part and modeling it up and turning it into this really nice professional looking throttle on my pontoon boat. So you can really pretty much do anything that you want with the software, a little bit of creativity. And if you're trying to get actual usable parts out, um, that's a $1,300 3D printer that you can have in two days from Amazon. So a little bit of creativity and some access to some fabrication and you can really do you know anything uh, with the software. And frankly, it's an exercise. Um, stick time is what the software is about. If you're using it, you're getting better, whether you're doing work for work or whether you're doing work for yourself. So it's an exercise in any respect. Inspection is a pretty narrow subset of what happens in companies. And typically where inspection sits is we're taking what we've done in CAD and we throw it over the wall to somebody who then has to pull parts off of a line and then test them or measure them and make sure that they're corroborating with the data that we have in the 2D drawing. Um, so that's where inspection basically comes in. Making inspection documents is a standard thing, but it is tedious, it's time consuming, and it's error prone because it's a very manual process up to this point. So not difficult. Yes? We are recording it, so it's going to actually be up on the Smooth Logics website. So I'm going to throw it on this flash drive and they'll have it here shortly. So Sorry, no, that's okay. Make highlights of the things that you want to go back and check if you want to see it at a different pace. But yep, I'm recording the screen and, and we'll have it. So there are two interfaces that we use for this product. Uh, part of it is because of the way the product was originally distributed and because of the way legacy data works. And then part of it is just technological advances that we've done um, since we've had the tool at SolidWorks. And the interfaces are essentially built into SolidWorks, uh, like we do with a lot of our solution partner applications, single window working directly on SolidWorks files. And then the other one is what we call standalone. Now, standalone has its advantages because it's not consuming a SolidWorks license or working in the SolidWorks interface. Um, but you're not dealing with SOLIDWORKS native data in that case. So there's a little bit more hand-holding or um, you know, uh, very meticulous work that has to be done with those files. Now, originally, it was all based on marking up uh, PDF or TIFF images, PDFs and TIFFs being quality images. Um, the purpose of that is because it relies on optical character recognition for the standalone application. So you want crisp, sharp letters so that it can recognize them. 
And then with the standalone, that's where we can actually interface with a coordinate measuring machine or digital calipers or some other type of measurement device to then put what the actual physical measured dimension is back into the document against what the dimension was supposed to be. So you'll see what that process looks like. And then we work on negative drawings in SolidWorks. Well, that was around 2015 or so. 2016 and 2017, we got some big development. And then what we've got now is a little bit of a different look to this. It's no longer just SolidWorks drawings, it's now SolidWorks files. Um, it's 3D parts that have model-based definition annotations on them, and then our regular 2D drawings, and I'm gonna show you each of those. But now in our standalone application, it's not just relegated to these flat images, essentially, a PDF and a TIFF. We can now do native CAD files, which is much more effective because when it's native, it's not just a screen dump, it's active elements, it's dimensions that you can pick. Therefore, it's much easier to grab them and, and inject them into the process. So we'll do that natively with DWG files, which is fantastic because we have three plus decades of that stuff sitting around. And then Pro-E or Creo native, depending on how old you are, you'll call that something different. And then CATIA V5 as well. So this actually gives me an opportunity, and you'll see how this is, is uh, to be able to read a CATIA drawing, which I've never been able to do, not even in a viewer application. It's a CAT drawing file. It's ridiculous. So um, kind of an interesting thing. So we're going to start with inspection add-in, which is the one that works single window inside of SOLIDWORKS. And I usually do this backwards because inspection standalone is easy yet very tedious and takes us 15 or 20 minutes to show that to you. And then we go into SOLIDWORKS and I press four buttons and it's done. So we're just going to start with the four button picks and show you that. Um, do you anticipate getting outside data very often, if ever? Or are you pretty isolated with the SOLIDWORKS data that you would have internally? Uh, just the DWG files from AutoCAD or Pro-E or other, other product data? Yes, yes, and then we've been downloading vendor parts and stuff. Yeah, would you need to inspect those, though, or have to deal with that? Um, not Depends on if you're producing that, so. Okay, we're going to cover both scenarios either way, just looking more at what you're, what you're getting into. So the inspection add-in, what this allows us to do is take native SOLIDWORKS drawings, answer a few questions effectively, and then say go. And it takes care of the entire process. Now what we're replacing with this, just to set up what happens, is there's this thing called the FAI, First Article Inspection Document. And what happens there is you type things in. So you're typing in the dimension, it's plus and minus tolerances, and then the arithmetic of that. So it's the high and low limits. And then all that is manual typing, which every time your fingers hit the keyboard, there's a chance that you make an error. So we try to eliminate that and go right off the drawing and inject it directly into the spreadsheet. And then it just allows us to categorize things in, in even more exotic ways. So let me bop into SOLIDWORKS here for a second and show you exactly what we're talking about here. Okay, so I'm in SOLIDWORKS and just gonna open up a basic 2D drawing here. Working on the native data is always gonna be better because of the fact that it is active, clickable things. Um, image requires us to, to box or window select things particularly. So when we're looking at a SOLIDWORKS file, of course, uh, this one happens to be of just a part file. There are two sheets. Uh, second sheet's got some configuration data on it in some cases for machining purposes. Um, different holes that weren't there with this pre-machined pr uh, version on the, the first sheet. The way inspection functions is through a toolbar up here inside of SOLIDWORKS, and it really just walks you through the process. So we begin by starting a new inspection project, and over here in our property manager, it flies out and gives us some choices of templates. In every respect, a template is a starting point with predictable setup settings. Okay, so we're just going to stick with the default template here, but if you're ANSI or ISO, um, you can go with either of those. The template allowed me to predetermine a few things getting injected into this. Uh, things like the part number, the part name. These pulled from the active properties right in the SOLIDWORKS files, which is great because they're associative. Change it in the file, it'll change here. Screen capture does not work that way. Uh, so it grabbed a few of those. Now if I wanted to fill out something else, maybe I des didn't designate what a part number was or it was called something different in the file, by clicking any of these buttons that enables you to look through the properties of either the drawing or the part on the drawing, which is another way to deal with that. And then by picking any one of these properties and saying OK, it'll simply place that property into the field. Now there's other things that you can have like vendors lists. These lists are different to everybody, so what I have here is completely customizable. Uh, up here is a button that says edit vendors, that's how you create that. There's also an operations list and inspection methods, which would essentially be the equipment that you have available to you. I've got a pretty elaborate list on mine, but um, everybody's going to be isolated to what they actually own. The other questions we typically answer are little things, like what is your default classification for a balloon? Now in some cases, the shape determines whether it's an important balloon or a basic balloon. Incidental is the term we use here, but there's critical and major and minor too. Uh, we're just gonna stick with incidental for the basics, and then how it extracts um, the actual uh, um, numbers themselves, I always leave this as automatic. Manual is the one where you just simply click them 
and then it would extract as you click them. Uh, depending on your past life, AutoCAD users, though it's a very manual tool, it's very controllable as well. And they could balloon in the order that meant whatever it meant to them. Uh, that's effectively what we're talking about here. And manual is good if you just want to maybe inspect a few key dimensions and not the entire sheet. So there's just ways to isolate. But you'll see how automatic functions. Uh, automatic renumbering is something that takes place if you make a change, add a dimension. And then when you say go, it will renumber all the balloons and maybe change some of the balloon numbers. Uh, a lot of cases we don't like that to happen. I'm going to leave that off for now, but you'll see the effects of what we get there. The last part of this before I move forward is uh, this thing called sampling. In, in companies that make large lot sizes of things, they have numbers that really matter on what this uh, acceptable quality level, this AQL value is. There's actually a chart that demystifies what numbers get picked. And it's so many goods, so many random samples, and then so many passes or fails. And it all kind of correlates to these cells that indicate um, what you're putting in here for this acceptable quality level feature. Uh, most people don't use that, but it is something there that is uh, another exceptional level of accuracy when it comes down to your data. Again, not everybody bites that off. When you click next, you can isolate or filter some of the dimensions or features um, and items that are on the drawing. So if you didn't want notes, for example, to be part of the uh, bill of characteristics, then you deselect those types of things. So I wouldn't include notes. Uh, different types of dimensions. Sometimes you use just the inspection only, and it's going to take ones that have the inspection balloon around. But if we want everything else, including basic dimensions, then we just go ahead and select that. Now there's an additional feature here that allows us to deal with or um, apply a tolerance to dimensions that have no tolerance. Essentially you give it a range. How many significant digits are there? And then if there's that many significant digits, then it'll apply a particular tolerance to each of those. That's something you can throw into the FAI document. It won't affect anything on the SOLIDWORKS drawing. That's really all that it takes to make this product work. When you click go, this is the fun part, I'll hit the check mark, I'll sit back for about five seconds and we'll watch all these balloons just pop right in there. Done. It's fantastic. Now what it does with that is it gathers all the data, data pieces. Um, I won't call them metadata because that's more of a PDM thing, but it's all the little uh, data pieces of each of these items. So here we have balloon number one that was applied here, and it combined these into actually 1.1 .1 through 1.4 for each line of this inspection note. You can see all the details that show up here as well. As we scroll down, you're going to see things like the GTAL box. By clicking it, it actually highlights out here on the screen. You can see it right there in blue. And anytime you want to click something and maybe you don't see it, it could be a very large, complex drawing, a little right click on there can do a zoom to selection and that will just dive you right in on that particular feature. Now conversely to all of this, if you click something on the screen, say I go ahead and click this GTAL, it's actually going to find it over in the Bill of Characteristics tree. So everything is associative just the way a feature to the feature manager has always been. So there's some things that you can do granularly to change some of the characteristics. Uh, as we zoom in here just a little bit, I've got this num number 14 that's a plus or minus 0 0.02 and then it's a, a 0.325, so three eights there. So when we get into this, you can change different things, but it does detect a lot of stuff. The units are already there, uh, the type of dimension that it is, whether it's a radius or a length, those types of things show up automatically. If this is a, a more important dimension in the SOLIDWORKS interface, you can tag it as a key dimension. And what that will do is change the way that the balloon is tagged looks. So again, kind of effectively upping the priority there. Now in reality, you can also affect the priority by changing that default incidental and making it something a little bit more important, like a critical. And these allow us to categorize and filter things and then um, sort them by critical, then incidental, then minor, if, if they needed to be done in that order. Uh, other things that can be done at this point as well, you really do have a lot of, of choice to, to do some massaging. So if the tolerance level needed to be a little different, you could tweak that right here manually. But the main thing is, is that it takes your nominal value, it adds the plus and minus tolerance, and it gives you those upper and lower limits. So it's essentially confirming all of this little data set that happens to be there. With the SOLIDWORKS um, interface like we have here, it really automates that entire process as we go. Now, changes can happen. Uh, changes essentially happen if either the part changes or you insert dimensions or add dimensions. There's a lot of reasons why something like that might happen. In this case, what I'm going to do is just go to my basic sketch tools, grab a smart dimension, and we'll throw, um, do I have an overall value? I'm going to throw out an odd value that's not there. Let's just go between uh, that point and this point, something like that. I'll try that one more time. Uh, that'll be a little easier. Okay, so I've just added a dimension. Now, what I'm going to do is just hit rebuild. Basic Windows Rebuild, or Basic SOLIDWORKS Rebuild. And as I scroll through the BOC over here on the side, what you're going to notice is something pretty obvious. Although the colors here are pretty funky, the green does show up pretty good. It's just indicating a change, a new thing. So it found that this balloon or this dimension had now appeared, and it wasn't there prior to this. 
what happens with it is you have the opportunity to accept or reject it. So if you look at it, it, it points out that it's there, you look at it, you can right click and say, okay, I want this, um, or I can want them all if I don't want to go through them one at a time. And by accepting it, it then automatically puts a balloon number on it, in this case, at the end of the list. So 24, um, if I would have done automatic renumbering, it would have sat somewhere between four and 15, depending on the counterclockwise as it swoops out. Uh, what that would have ended up doing though is renumbering all of the balloons on sheet two because they would have been in chronological order. So I don't like that feature because if you've been dealing with a drawing for a long time, one incidental change might change the, the way the numbers are um, flushed out. And that's just a, a moving target for a lot of people. So when we've got this thing ballooned, the purpose is to be able to throw it over the wall to somebody else to deal with the actual inspection. So that's where you're actually kicking out the files. Uh, two ways we deal with this one. The main one is actually just exporting to Excel. There's an optional, which is a PDF file. The PDF would give you your drawing here with the balloons on it. Depending on what you have internally for access, you might have PDM set up or you'd have people have viewable capabilities to get to this drawing. They wouldn't need to have a PDF for that. Uh, but if you want to export a PDF of a drawing like this, it's essentially just putting that in. We're going to do a new lower plate fog just to make it a unique file. And then that kicks the PDF out and should fire it up. It's usually what happens when PDFs are created. Okay, we'll get that opened up in just a second. You'll get to see that. I'm also going to export to Excel. This also gives you the opportunity to choose templates. Uh, PPAP is a term that I hear a lot out there for the, the processing. Uh, AS9102 though is the hard and fast standard that we're referring to here when it comes to inspection. So that's what really governs the, uh, the types of annotations and the way they lay out on the bill of characteristics. So I'm just gonna stick with that and hit go. So what happens on this is it's gonna go ahead and now create um, this Excel spreadsheet. So it's gonna take everything that's on there. It actually yelled at me about something there. I accepted that change, I did a rebuild. Okay, let's kick that off one more time, sorry. I didn't even read what it was saying. We're gonna do lower plate fog on this one just to make it unique. So it fills out the entire spreadsheet and this is where the rubber meets the road. You could sit here and make an easy spreadsheet like this but it's automatically injecting every little bit about it. Even a little image there for each of these uh, GTAL boxes uh, gives you exactly what it should look like. We're up here, it's not even characters. It'll give you the plus and minus, like I said here. So there's your nominal, there's your range. And in the row here, the column here that's for results, as I zoomed in, they also build into this what we call data validation, which means if somebody types in the value or injects it with a USB uh, button on digital calipers or some other tool, if you type in the value, say 0.25, that doesn't show up there very well. It's green, uh, looks more black than anything. So if you're inside the range, it'll give you that range. If I say 0.762, that's outside. So now it shows as a red. So those will come in there automatically uh, with that type of a visual to the file. So really that's all we're getting out of there. It's form one, two, and three when it comes to the first article inspection. So this form one actually is uh, being filled out by a lot of the properties that we had selected initially. So the revision number there, the part number that was there, uh, we went ahead and grabbed that value out of the properties and it automatically put it into the proper part of the, uh, the first article inspection. The second sheet here has a lot more to do with uh, material acquisitions, raw materials, the specs that they have on those. So we really didn't have anything to, to add to this one. This is a type of document, this, this default one that we have here, I'll go into this in a little bit where if you already have documentation that's built up that's similar to this, what we can do is we can take yours and put the proper tokens, the things that refer to the upper limit dimensions, the lower limit dimensions, the result dimensions, and we can put them in your spreadsheet and tell it what column or what row to fill out, uh, therefore keeping the look and feel the same as you already use on your spreadsheets, but injecting the smarts to it, if you will. So that's something that can be done with, uh, with your existing data, or you can use the templates that we provide. So that's basically just the 2D drawing portion of that, but that's the main thing that happens these days. It's always a 2D drawing, and we're starting to change that a bit, and there's other technologies that are making that happen. So inside of SOLIDWORKS natively, we can also do this from parts and assemblies, and that actually goes into my next presentation, which is the model-based definition features. Um, have you ever dealt with MBD or model-based definition? Or are you starting to get files or hear this type of term talked about at all? Okay. So what we've got here is, um, let me just go ahead and open up this file for you. Uh, this is a user group, there we go. 
So what we're doing on this one here is um, I'm going to open up another uh, document that's got everything built into it already. So when we're looking at 3D parts, and in fact, I'm going to grab one that's a, a little bit more specific to this. I like this one here. This is a 3D part that we've added model-based definition annotations to. What MBD is, and if you stick around for the second presentation, is it's getting away from making 2D drawings altogether. Uh, 2D drawings are time consuming, I think everybody can agree on that. And the way life is today, we start with a 3D part. We didn't always have 3D parts, we've always had drafting boards. But we take our 3D part and we put it on a familiar 2D drawing because we've always done that. And then hope that the person that gets your 2D drawing makes you the proper 3D part. And when you think of it that way, 2D drawings sound kind of ridiculous these days. So because we have the 3D part already, we allow you to annotate that 3D part. Now, when we do that type of a thing, it, it is literally annotating it without um, awareness or care of feature history or how those features are built. Because one of the things that, that is great in demos but isn't great in practice is the ability to bring in dimensions from a part to a drawing. And the reason being is when you build a part, these dimensions are essentially isolated features that are put in in dimensions such that predictable dimension change happens, not manufacturing dimensions necessarily. You're trying to make it so your part updates predictably with uh, feature history. But then we put it on a drawing and we re-scheme it by adding the dimensions that are appropriate for actual manufacturing. So here we're doing that in 3D without really caring where a feature started or ended or how it came to be. I can come in here with model-based definition and at any point I can add dimensions directly to the part. And when you add these types of dimensions, it gives you values like tolerances automatically. It will let you know if your part is over-toleranced or under-toleranced when it comes to the actual 3D um, of it. And in some cases, we can go directly to machining from the same MBD type of, of feature. What happens though, is we have a part that still needs to be inspected, but I haven't made a drawing of it. So where inspection goes now is the exact same process. I start a new inspection project, I use my template, we'll hit next a couple of times. This one pulled in a ton of properties, which is fantastic. And all I have to do is hit next, next, go, and then sit back, and now on my 3D part, I'm gonna get the exact same type of ballooning that takes place. So what's fantastic about this is that I eliminated the need to actually make a drawing, but I get the exact same benefit for all the little features and dimensions that are on this 3D part, and I can categorize those as such using the same type of input. So from here, I export to Excel, same steps, and now it takes my 3D part and builds the exact same type of BOC. All those balloons that look like they're floating, is it pulling that from other dimensions that are part of the, keeping the shape, but not necessarily that you had already? Yeah, it was my point of view. If I go to a specific orientation, so right now I'm looking at an isometric, which makes things really look bad. Uh, if we go to like a standard front view, and some of those shouldn't even be there for the dimensions that are shown, because all of those balloons are physically showing on this one. And if we look at like a side view, for example, some of those balloons are for those side views where some of them are for the fronts. So making the different views for model-based definitions a little bit of a different step on this as well. Um, but yeah, in this case, there's a few dimensions I should have missed because I shouldn't have 32. But that goes back to that um, setting that we chose here at the end is what to include. So in a lot of cases, you wouldn't include basic dimensions with these types of things. So that'd be something that I would take off. And then if we go ahead and redo all of this, it renumbers everything and gets rid of a lot of that extraneous stuff. So you should actually see that renumber and uh, be a little cleaner. Yeah, still more that are showing. But I do have some feature dimensions that are physically hidden that it's taken into account as well. So yeah, there is a, a couple of parts to that. There's a few more of those guys there. So we wanna isolate that down. And the MBD stuff will show you how to isolate that if you do stick around for that one a little later. But the spreadsheet is still the same type of thing. It'll give you the type of dimension, length, radial, um, diameter was showing up here as well, and then fills it out for you the same way. So really that's what we're trying to do is eliminate that process. Now as I move with this, um, I'm gonna get into the standalone portion of it. Oh great, I'm talking past my slides here. Um, we're gonna get into the standalone portion of it because there's a unique feature that the standalone portion does, which is that interaction with coordinate measuring machines. Uh, but this tool out of the box really relies a lot on that optical character recognition up until the point where we now do some more of the, uh, the native files. So I'm going to really briefly just pull this open and show you a little bit of the OCR and how that functions. And a little bit then after that on just some native files here to show you how much better that happens to be. So the files of type that we get here, the two different extensions for TIFF, we got a PDF down here, and then everything in between is basically new. So this cat drawing, Again, never had a way to look at a cat drawing, let alone open it and do something with it before. 
uh, DWG, DXF, effectively the same type of thing. And then .prt. That one there is a little different because a .prt is essentially a unigraphics type of a file. Um, .prt dot would then be a Creo file. So that one there, we're supposed to be able to read Creo files into this. So I think there's a little mistake in just the way that that looks. But that's what we're talking about with these native types of files. So the way this tool actually functions now is as a separate window. So this is now its own interface uh, outside of SOLIDWORKS. The process is essentially the same though. Um, we start projects based on templates, and then using those templates, we then open up the files that we want to inspect. So with this one here, I'm gonna go ahead and open up a PDF document. And when the PDF opens, again, it's basically just a high quality image. Uh, at this point, we're gonna get into it and navigate and do a couple of particular things. So we have some sidebars that fly out, got to pin those in place, and it's really a more effective tool on a couple monitors at least because of all these little windows. Uh, I find it to be very much like a video editing uh, tool with this where I'd like a lot more screen space. Now as I mentioned, these types of items here are really more, um, in this PDF aspect, uh, functioning on optical character recognition. So one of the keys to making this work very well is zooming in. And if it's bigger and clearer on the screen, that's going to be better for OCR. If you're zoomed way out on something, that's smaller pixels. Simple as that. So zooming in is a very simple tip to be able to get this thing to be uh, a bit more readable when it comes to just the OCR portion. Plus, it's easier just to simply window select things this way. So I want to get into things like part name and part number. When you grab these, you simply click an icon. Part name on this one, I'm just going to grab the name of the file, get as close as I can without extra pixels, and then from there, tries to do a pretty good job at doing the OCR. Now there's two things I could do up here. There's obviously it didn't work very well there. I could either go ahead and uh, try and do it by cleaning it up, or we can actually just go ahead and do it again, get rid of it altogether. In some cases, again, it's just basically how zoomed you are or how much extra pixels you get inside of one of these things. Uh, but in most cases, it does read quite nicely. Part number here is a bit more exotic. Extra pixels is just more to read, so we wanna grab those. The closer you get, the better it is. If you happen to uh, grab a dimension, for example, and hook up one of these little extension lines, that looks like a negative in the window of capture. So we don't want to get any overlap and any extra stuff uh, outside of that. So we do some things like this. This will fill out those sheets on the first article inspection document. But for the rest of it, we're grabbing different characteristics on an as-needed basis. So we choose specifically, is it a note, is it a GTAL box, is it a dimension, or others. And from that, we're really just doing window selections. So again, picking a window, making sure that it looks good, uh, I just basically do a quick scan over here and everything seems to look fine. It's just a rinse and repeat. So it's very repetitive at this particular point. I'm going to try and get these done as quick as possible. When you get down into the dimensions though, the OCR is quite smart. As I grab my dimension tool and start window selecting things like this plus minus tolerance, same thing here. Knows it's a length dimension, puts you what the visual screen capture looks like and even a bitmap of what it looks like up here. And then you can just quickly say, yeah, got the 0.325, got the plus or minus right, and it will do the math for you, no problem. So really, it's just a quick window look. Look over there, did it look about right? And then you just kind of keep going with it. It does pretty good. Now, other dimensions that are a little bit more sophisticated. Here we have a multiple. we got radiuses. So when you go ahead and put the, the window around that, um, I'm not going to do it just yet. Look where my cursor is right now. This is the previous selection. See how it says quantity of one? When you window select one that has a 2x in there, it automatically picks up that quantity of two. So it throws it down here, gives you a radius, shows you that it is a multiple quantity. And in these types of situations, you can choose to actually separate those out into separate balloons if you want to. So that would give it an 8.1 and an 8.2 instead of just being an eight. Uh, and even in those cases, we've got some opportunities to take what we've got there and ungroup those, um, tape the grouping and actually merge them into a single, or just ungroup them all together and then have two separate balloons. So in that case, maybe we want to go ahead and you know, drop that balloon over where that radius actually would be, which is right over here. So there's a lot of different ways to get these types of things together. Right click those again, group them, group them with a shared balloon, they all go right back to the same balloon number. So a lot of interesting um, uniqueness that you can do with each of those types of fields. But every type of tolerance works. So if you've got a plus or minus there, if it's uh, a limit, if it's a plus or minus built into it, or in this case, the limit, each one of those is going to show in both respects. So it's quite a good tool for that. The GTAL tool essentially is taking a screen grab. So it doesn't find the A, the B, the C, or the 0 .02. It just basically gives you something on the spreadsheet that says C image or you know C sheet. 
So it's actually showing you what the image looks like, but it's not trying to fill in each of those little elements um, exactly to it. Now, if you do want it to be a little bit more rich that way, you can come in there and start adding in each of those. So if I just want to go ahead and parrot this and say, okay, this is a time where I'm going to go ahead and type in a little bit. We'll put those values in. We'll put the 0.20. And then now that's going to give us a much more rich experience down here in the bill of characteristics. Uh, but it generally doesn't read a full uh, geometric tolerance box uh, right through the screen grab. Okay, with all that said, what it's doing down here now is building a different bill of characteristics. Now, we don't see the same type of interface inside of SOLIDWORKS. We essentially have it over stuck in the property manager. But what we get down here is a little bit more of a matrix or a chart. And with things like this, we can sort based on the columns. So that's a typical thing in any Windows environment, whether it happens to be the upper or the lower limits or the, the character ID, which is a pretty common one. We just want those to be in numerical order in a lot of cases. But what we also go ahead and sort by um, are different types of things like the methods. And that would be, say, an inspection method, for example. So if I pick this particular dimension and say that if we wanted to go ahead and inspect that with a particular type of equipment, so these lists being something that you can customize to exactly what you do, uh, if you don't have digital calipers, take it off the list. You use gauge blocks, leave it on the list. But that's how you go ahead and give yourself additional grouping methods of the types of dimensions and how they would actually be, um, be inspected. So again, classifications and methods, if we do a few of those as CMMs, and maybe just for fun here, I'm going to control select a few others, and maybe we'll just call those a uh, laser. Those give us some capabilities of actually grouping things. So if you want to show what's in this area here, we can basically group the items, oh, different way, um, group them based on the method. So if we want to go ahead and just show um, ascending, descending, or sort based on this, let's just go ahead and sort um, ascending on that one. So there's your lasers again, there's your CMMs, and we can group them as such as well. The numbers that are out there can easily be changed for, you know, just the uh, fact that you might want to do that. It's not always uh, recommended. We like to keep them in order in most cases. Uh, but just by dragging things around the tree is the easiest way to go ahead and do that. So if I drag one balloon down below another or up above another, then those numbers are essentially going to sort in a different order. And I'm not getting my character IDs to sort here, so I think you're noticing that. But that's okay, I'm not gonna worry about that one too much. All right, let's do it that way. The outputs are essentially the same. You're kicking this out to either a spreadsheet again or a PDF file. Um, other than that, there is some nice functionality for when files change built into this tool as well. So what we have are a bunch of dimensions that we've actually dealt with. Uh, visually on something like this, it's really nice to actually look at this, and say, you know what, everything that I've worked on so far looks pretty good. Um, let's go ahead and hide the extracted annotations. And that cleans up the sheet to say, okay, that's the stuff uh, that's actually not done yet. Really is an easy way to figure out what you've missed and what you haven't. So I like doing those kinds of things. Uh, but what can also happen quite often is you switch out the sheet. Um, you're going to go ahead and you know, swap it for another one and get some changes that might happen as a result of that type of an operation. So that can be brought into this as well. What happens though in most cases in the standalone is there is the step here where we're actually going to go ahead and do the inspection process. So down here in the corner is where our coordinate measuring machine input actually takes place. Now if you don't have a CMM, could just be digital calipers which is a $10 thing at Harbor Freight and then a USB cord that actually has a little button on it and all you have to do is highlight the cell, measure something, tap the button and it will take that measurement and put the value into the cell. So that stops manual interaction as well. But if you have those types of numbers, we get the same kind of vetting here. So I have a plus or minus or an upper lower limit of 0.7 down to 0.66. If I go 0.68, that actually gives me something that's green, of course, and it highlights it here in my highlighted area. It gives you something that's outside the range, so say 0.29, that's going to give you something that shows as red. And in some cases, if you go right on the edge of this, so this is a 3.496, it's actually the lower limit, um, that's shown as yellow because that's right on the edge of the acceptance band. So those are some nice visuals that you get there. So this would be more of a manual method. If you do have a coordinate measuring machine available to you, the great part about this tool is it's not new software. It's been around for quite a while even before it was called SOLIDWORKS Inspection. And what happens with this is you can go ahead and read data from known sources. Um, what's important is just like it is with, or with, uh, um, with actually creating G-code, with doing CAM, the controller is the key to making the machine move and do the cutting properly. So knowing how to properly post-process is the key to making this function. Well, knowing what machine it's coming from allows us to process the data properly and um, sort it out correctly. So I happen to know that this data comes from PC Demus uh, for my particular controller. 
And what I'm gonna do here is go ahead and bring in some files. Now for what I'm working on right now, this one actually has um, multiple files that we created with this one. So this is gonna be my standalone. And uh, I've got my PC Demos files, actually three different inspection sets here I'm gonna bring in at one time. Now what it'll do is it will show me all of these different values, but I can now assign them as if I've done these one at a time, but I can do it in bulk um, to the dimensions that we've captured on screen. And we do that auto assign by either choosing one or several categories here. I would use item number if I had produced this drawing, handed it to somebody, and then they measured in that order. That would be easy, match up the numbers, we're good. But in many cases, if somebody measured it in an odd order, what I would do is skip the item number and I would say, you know what? The type of dimension, the nominal value, and the plus and minus tolerance, if all four of those match, then match those dimensions up. Chances are it's only going to be unique dimensions. So what we'll take all three of these documents, <coughs> excuse me, all three of the full inspections, and when I say OK, it's going to overwrite the data that I've got in those columns and show me the first, second, and third inspected part and what those values actually are and correlate. So if I look at my second part here, it shows me all the greens on the screen, and the colors again are a little bit off. These are all green here. Um, these values didn't have anything that matched on the sheet. So I'm kicking through, I'm kicking through. Looks like I've got green, green, and green on each of those. Uh, again, any reds would show up as such. Now there is a method with this, and as I mentioned, when you're dealing with the standalone application, this is where the CMM is. We can't do coordinate measuring machine inputs in SOLIDWORKS. So that means with the add-in, on the native file, which is where it's easier to work, we don't have that interaction. So the 3D files that we do in standalone are basically competitors' files. We have Katia v5, we have the Pro E files that you see there, and with those files, with their own model-based definition on it, I can bring that into inspection standalone and inspect. For SOLIDWORKS files, however, we can take our SOLIDWORKS native documents, um, deal with those directly inside of SOLIDWORKS, and then export that to what we call a, an inspection project. So now what we're talking about is we're going back into the SOLIDWORKS native interface. I'm looking at, say, this 2D drawing right here that we were doing prior to this. If I wanted to deal with coordinate measuring machine interaction here, what I would do is take this file and I would actually export the inspection project. So by exporting this project, this lower plate IXPR, it now creates a document that is as if it was built in the standalone application. So now I can go ahead back into standalone, which is this one right here, um, start a new project. Actually, we're going to open a project, which will close this one. And then in this case, we're going to grab uh, exactly what I just did there, which was the add-in file. So now we bring in the one that we created in SOLIDWORKS. We now have it in standalone, completely populated, same characteristics, same items over the tree. And then we would be able to do our coordinate measuring machine inputs into the standalone application. So we get the benefit of being able to automate the process tremendously, but then do the final process, which is that coordinate measuring machine interaction. So a couple of different ways to get that one done. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it right there. So the other thing was sitting in the standalone application. So here we are once again sitting right here. I'm gonna do one more new project. This one here will start off with ANSI inch, but the file I'm gonna open in this particular case is actually gonna be uh, a DWG file for what we're creating. So let me just run over again real quick to my presentations folder. And, oh, this is standalone, excuse me. We're gonna grab just a basic 2D DWG, so this is right out AutoCAD. Now, standalone was optical character recognition the last time I showed it to you. But when we're dealing with native data, of course, that gives us the capabilities to highlight and select things quite easily. So in this case, now when I'm dealing with a bill of characteristics, I can just grab my dimensions tool, which I don't even need to do right yet. Um, we'll go ahead and grab our dimensions tool, and I'm gonna use Smart Extract. So you see how these things are highlighting when I hover over those? We'll zoom in on those just a little bit better. Smart Extract enables me to just grab the number. Fills it all out. Way better than window selecting. In fact, in this case, window selecting is very good for actually doing multiple dimensions at the same time. So you can window select in whatever orders make sense and rapidly create that document from a regular DWG file. So it's incredible how quick that works. Now standalone also has the granular effect of being able to select a characteristic, change its method, maybe make this, I'm sorry, the classification to make this a little bit more hardcore, let's go to critical, and uh, th things like that can control balloon shapes as well. Um, this template I used didn't have that one on there, I apologize for that. 
Uh, but that can make hexagon versus triangle versus circle if it's a, a little bit more important. The same thing, we've taken now a DWG file, um, set it up for inspection and dealt with some of the minutia, and then from that point, it's able to be exported as well right to Excel. What's also interesting about exporting to Excel from standalone is an interesting feature down here called snapshots. The output is a spreadsheet, and a spreadsheet typically is bland cells, rows, matrix with numbers. But the snapshot actually allows you to include what you see graphically on the spreadsheet as well. So we get the snapshot here, which is the entire model. I'm just going to grab that entire thing. But what I can also do is grab my own snapshot. So I'm going to zoom in and say, okay, right about here, that's something I want somebody to see. I'm going to grab a snapshot. And what that will do is go ahead and actually put that in. And then when I'm ready to export, I grab the views that I want, and I say export. So we're going to take this now, and we're going to call this one Plate Fair um, Excel. So it'll do all these little screen grabs. It takes our entire bill of characteristics, and then it gives me a spreadsheet that doesn't just have three tabs to the bottom of it. Uh, when we look at it, what we have is our sheet one, which is our basic um, sheet with our FAI information. But then it gives you these screen grabs. So that's the entire sheet. This is the zoomed in version that I have. And this wouldn't require anybody to have a PDF nor access to the SOLIDWORKS document through PDM. It's going to give them what they need to see right here off of the spreadsheet itself. Uh, I thought there was another tab down there, but I don't see that one down there. So that's going to give us all the data we need on this sheet. Depends on that template. So for the most part, that really covers everything that we do with it. It's not intended to be an exotic tool. It's intended to take that very manual input and uh, make it as automatic as possible. So standalone does some great things. It is a different interface by design, but it's got a lot more capabilities when it comes to the, the full process of dealing with coordinate measuring machines. So that's where we go with that. Now, when it comes down to it, interesting, when it comes down to it, um, this template editor that I was talking about before, the templates themselves, this is a spreadsheet that we give you. And we give you a few different ones of these from a format standpoint, but if you've already got your own documentation, it's a matter of editing those. So at any point, we could either be in SolidWorks or inside of the inspection standalone, and we can go ahead and launch our template editor. So I'm just gonna go directly into SolidWorks for that, and right up here on the top, going to see our launch template editor. Now what it'll do for us is it'll bring up Excel and it will bring up whichever generic template or document you already have. The idea here is that we're putting in data tokens, essentially what the properties of the element you want in what column or what row. So if we look really close at this, let me zoom in on the spreadsheet, you'll see that right here at the top of this, we see upper limit, we see lower limit, we see results. And when you click in these cells beneath it, it gives you this really cryptic token here that's talking about an attribute, which in this case is the dim upper limit. So that goes into this entire column and the order of the bill of characteristics, one through whatever. Um, results are something you type in. Lower limits, the unit of measure, the requirement, characteristics, all of that stuff is based on a token. So if I had a particular cell here, and results isn't the cell I want, but whatever this happened to be, if I needed this column to be filled out with a particular property, you select the cell, you say, I want this to be a characteristic, which is the BOC again, the Bill of Characteristics, and I want that to be something like an upper or lower limit or a key or whatever they happen to be. Uh, so in my particular case, let's just call that upper limit, and you'll see that it will put that token in there. So we just insert, and it gives you the code piece that needs to be there in order for that column to get populated properly. Over the last two years, we've changed it from just being column-based to actually being row-based because we do see a lot of companies that do that. So there's a chance or a choice, excuse me, between vertical-based templates and horizontal-based templates. Simple as that. That just means that subsequent characters are going to go off to the right instead of down in rows. Mm, this is setting up the format of the design table, yes. Um, so in this case, this would be it's the best way to describe that. Because what it's going to do is it's going to put in every row for you automatically. Um, so you've got 50, bill or 50 characteristics, it'll start at the first open row, it'll put the first one in, and then it will just keep populating each of those. So all you're doing is setting up the formatting of what you want in which row or which column, and then this is what you use to kick out the spreadsheet. It'll just take whatever you have on this document, and it will populate those with as many as you've inspected. So essentially you're setting up the template one time, and from that point you don't touch it again, or don't need to. So first sheet, form one has the, um, up here, the inspection property part number. 
Right over here is the inspection property part name. So that's how filling out those in the property manager automatically injects those into the proper formatted cells into your BOC here. So it's a little bit of setup. Set it up once, save it, and you're pretty much good to go from that point. Um, there's other document tokens as well. The characteristics are all the build characteristics items, but these could be just basic things like the data paths, um, the file name itself, file name number, lot size. So everywhere we made a decision, vendor name, part of a pull down menu, that's a, a property that you can have put into a cell um, to suit your needs. All right, template editing is fun. All right, then we took a look already. So I wanna thank the two of you for making that first presentation awesome. Yeah, we did have six signed up, I got you. Oh, the three of you, I'm sorry. I'm, the way I'm sitting, I didn't, I was, I could see Bill. I left Bill out on it. I left Bill out because I work with Bill. But yeah, you were sitting back there when I was saying that, sorry. Uh, do you have any questions about what you saw there or, or anything else? Yeah, I have a few questions. Sure. So, can you, you showed with dimensions that don't have any tolerances attached to those. Can you tie those to the default columns so that they don't show up on the title block? Or do you just have uh, I'm trying to think of one thing that I see on that. Um, can't tie them to it. Um, sorry, I've, I've really picked words apart because it's an important thing. Tying to me means associativity. So if you change that property, it would change in your inputs and those aren't linked to each other, but I would, it's a default setting. So if it's what you use on all of your drawings, you just set it up in inspection once going to the properties, yeah. So this is something where if you're in SolidWorks and you're running through each of those, um, there are some different template values that you can set up on each of those. Uh, but essentially, the last inputs that I use are the inputs it's going to use on the next one. So anytime I start a new inspection project to go through this, that's always going to be that last cell that gets put in there. So grab our template, we'll hit next again, what types, and then right here we can go through those different values. So angular versus, uh, versus linear. On the standalone, there is a physical um, interface setting for that. So we go into the options of the product, and then down here is where we set that type of thing up. So default tolerances for untoleranced items is what that comes down to. So yeah, you'd set that one one time if that's always what you have in your uh, in your title block. Say right about yeah, I don't even have them listed there um, specifically, but yeah, you would have something actual in that case. It's still just injecting essentially characters. So it doesn't care what the characters are, it's gonna go ahead and adjust those. If you're switching, um, for example, I'm on this one, I'm in English, so if I go over and say metric, it's gonna switch all of my values on the sheet to metric, which those all switched over. And then from that point, um, I wasn't even inspected on this one already actually. I refreshed that one. I'm gonna run through the whole process again and then just switch it over. Okay. So it will inspect and it will balloon. Um, numbers, as you can see here, are gonna be based on the nominal values and in metric. So all of those should be, yep, some pretty odd decimal places. Um, we're gonna switch it now midstream, because this part I have not done midstream, and it just actually refreshed live there. I don't know if you saw that. Um, so I'm on a 0.75, I'm gonna flip it back, because I didn't even expect it. I thought a rebuild would have to take place at least. But all I did was switch over to millimeters, gram seconds, hands off the wheel, and everything refreshed. That actually, Surprised me a little bit. But I thought I'd have to trigger something, but um, okay. Dual dimensions. Uh, dual dimensions. I'm going to turn on in a couple of cases some dual dimensions. It is going to take the nominal though. I do not believe it takes the entire dual dimension itself. Um, let's get into a couple of properties on this thing here. Come on, baby. Yeah, waiting for it there. All right, let's see what we get in that. It's going to be. Oh, you know what? Both my dimensions are set to metric, so that's a great one. And that's just because my duals are set to metric. There we go. So now I set the main one back to English. But yep, nominal value is going in there. Um, uh, primary units. So it will show, uh, but in this case, it's not going to take that secondary value. That looks pretty good. Okay. Not too bad. Any other questions? Okay. So once... The spreadsheet itself, once 
spit out is essentially unlinked at that point. Okay. What you're seeing here in the SOLIDWORKS file stays here, but the balloons themselves uh, go on a layer. So when you get into your tools here, if you just simply turn on your layer tool, you'll be able to come in here and you'll see this balloons. It even says in the description, created by inspection expert, which I gotta talk to the code guys because that was the original tool four and a half years ago. Wow, amazing. Um, that's attention to detail. But this is a hide show. So you just simply hide those when you don't want to work on them in a native file and turn them back on. So that would be uh, something be hideable and showable in a viewer as well. Uh, but that will live with the file. This information will be there and it will update every time the file gets changed um, or updated as necessary. Inspection expert. I see in documentation and in code where that's hard to change because that can affect things and trickle, but that's really too, too right up there. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> yeah, anything else? Yeah, you guys are a great audience, actually. When you, you pulled in um, the Casino the readout file, and it, like, it showed up more like green yes. on the bottom, bottom left, mm -hmm. what, what did you pull in? Was that just something that pre-populated as a demonstration? Well, what the CMM does is it will touch off on something, it will calculate the value and it will record it. So it puts them in there with all those data points. So there's usually a character number, so the one, two, three, four, five matching the balloons. Uh, it'll measure the value, and then essentially those numbers get pushed back into SolidWorks. Now, the thing is, is that they're formatted differently when they come from different machines. So when we're sitting here looking at these PC Demus files, for example, they'll have a header there that indicates some things that talk about PC Demus. Um, and then the way it's formatted, essentially, when it comes to the syntax for the item, the location on the drawing, the XY, and there's all kinds of little values here. So there's a plus and minus tolerance, um, a means, a deviation, and then an, an outer tolerance. So this will look different coming from a different controller, and that's why we need to know where it's coming from so we know how to sort out the, the points that are in there. But this would be the result of taking one part off, doing a, a full CMM on it which is either putting it into a fixture and then having the jewel touch off based on an automated machine or maybe someone coming in with a ferro arm or actual measurement devices and touching off. So um, this can get super, super automated and uh, non-touch visual inspection is a great way to do it. So you got your laser or whatever the booth type of scanner is. Is it a fairly newish machine? Yeah. Yeah, and that's okay, but the newer they are, the, the higher quality they're gonna be, frankly, first of all, because scanners over the years have, and quality, their, their uptick and their capabilities is amazing. So when that scanner generates a two or three files on its own, can I bring that in and compare? Well, that's the purpose, is to be able to tell that scanner what to then inspect and then have it, fit, it find the right dimensions for the features for you back. So we'd wanna know, um, I'm gonna go into standalone again here for a second. We'd wanna know if we were looking at the type of machine that's there, um, what this actual um, template controller happens to be. So we're looking for a name of a controller. So whether it's a Faro or a Calypso or some other type of uh, um, third party thing. Um, some of the more common ones, okay. Uh, I don't know if we got a K one there, if I saw that. Um, uh, Cadence, I don't know. I never, that sound like it, I am. So see what that looks like, because that's the type of file we're looking for. Yeah. And then that'll just format it. So we can get some details on exactly what the handshake method is, but in this case, if it's in the list, at least we're aware of the, the syntax that they use and the way they set it up. Got some guys over by us named Wenzel or Wenzel. Um, they're German, so they pronounce it with a V, but uh, they make all kinds of stuff that goes, they have touch, um, I think Metrosoft Cordis is what they use for their machines, but they also have CAT scan um, scanning now. So that's for non-destructive internal scanning. So you got the thread on the inside of a part, you can't touch it with anything, there's no way to get in there. So the only way to measure it is to cut it in half and then the part's worthless. So CAT scanning is a pretty incredible way to find out that kind of stuff. Um, but very much like 3D printing, CT data is the same thing as uh, sterile lithography or STL files, essentially, so cool. That'd be an interesting thing to try out then. Um, I am, I had a customer lined up for a project I wanted to do uh, because I live in a bit of a vacuum here. I have the tools, I don't do the practical thing on the field. And I had a customer lined up that had uh, machining capabilities, so CAM, as well as uh, CMM that he did quite often. 
And what I wanted to do was something where we took a part and in real life showed the entire loop of the process. So here's your part in SolidWorks, we make the feature, we take that feature and I can actually do CAM in SolidWorks now because everybody can if you have subscription service. And then um, make the part and then take that cammed part and inspect it and then inspect it back into inspection and show the full process of design, model-based definition, inspection, and then the real practical loop of all that. So that's something you're into. That'd be something I'd be into to doing, doing a case study and not only learning and how you, showing you how to do it or, or using yeah, the process. It's interesting because we're just at the point right now where we're about to work on a project, just got all our parts tools, just came in, have all our drawings, and now we've got this chaos machine and we can get some photos. Uh-huh. And trying to see, yeah, trying to see how to use that thing. So 